from the rising of the sun until the time when it goes down. The name of the Lord shall be praised. Sing it like you mean it. From the rising of the sun until the time when it goes down, the name of the Lord shall be praised. That's right. The Lord is high above all nations. His glory above the heavens. And who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high? Sing it again. Then the rising of the sun until the time when it goes down, the name of the Lord shall be praised. From the rising of the sun until the time when it goes down, the name of the Lord shall be praised. The Lord is high above all nations. The Lord is high above all nations. His glory above the heavens. And who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high from the rising of the sun? Till the time when it goes down, the name of the Lord shall be praised. From the rising of the sun until the time when it goes down, the name of the Lord shall be praised. The name of the Lord shall be praised. The name of the Lord shall be praised. One more time. The name of the Lord shall be praised. Hallelujah. Praise His name. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, filled of God in hell. Let's this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. body lay, light of the world and darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on Till he 
calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand till He returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Wednesday night service, just as a reminder, we're going through um, a Joyce Meyer teaching called Battlefield of the Mind. It is very, very, very good. I'm loving it. So hopefully uh, all of you can be there. It's at 6.30 on Wednesday nights, just a reminder. Secondly, another reminder is we are in the middle still of our baby bottle campaign for the Women's, Medi Women's Resource Medical Center, and which is a wonderful cause to save babies' lives. Um, you are what you are what you're holding. <laughs> anyway, um, the uh, baby bottle campaign goes on. So <laughs> you were late, but you got it. <laughs> anyway, there are some empty baby bottles out in the foyer. So grab a baby bottle, put either loose change or some bills or a check made out to the Women's Resource Medical Center. And you can give that to Cheryl up here or uh, me or Pastor Bill, and we'll make sure that it goes in the right spot. But it's a wonderful, wonderful cause. So let's have the good Four Seasons Church have a good showing here. All right, then uh, another reminder, we showed you a video clip last week. We're not gonna do that this week, I don't yes, think. We oh, we, we are. Yeah. Yes, we are. We, uh, we have a much better video clip this week. Uh, so if we go ahead and uh, dim the lights just as uh, one more time to uh, get a reminder of what Imago Day is all about coming up on the 22nd of this month. Get ready to be inspired and equipped. The annual Sanctity of Human Life Conference is back and better than ever. Saturday, June 22nd from 8 to 4 in the Palace Station Grand Ballroom. This one-day pro-life conference features keynote speaker Seth Gruber from White Rose Resistance. The mission of Imago Day is clear, to encourage and mobilize the church and pro-life community. We want you to be able to actively engage in the cultural, political, and spiritual battle for the protection of pre-born lives. Join Seth and the vast array of state and local church, civic, and community leaders. Tickets are just $30 and include a continental breakfast, lunch, and conference materials. Don't miss this opportunity to be part of something meaningful. The Sanctity of Human Life Conference, Saturday, June 22nd from 8 to 4 at Palace Station. Purchase tickets online at imagodayconference.com. That's I-M-A-G-O-D-E-I conference.com. Brought to you by Red Rock World Missions and the Southern Nevada Church and Faith Community. And we can thank Kathy News for getting us a better uh, video than we had last week. Now, I know Stephanie has another announcement or two, but next week is going to be a very exciting service you don't want to miss. It's going to be our celebration service of 20 years. Uh, we began this church, that's right, on, on June the 6th of 2004, and so we'll actually be three days past our birthday, uh, June the 9th. And then, of course, on the, so it's going to be great. We're going to have a great celebration. Now, normally, over the years, we've had like a, a lunch, a, you know, a big celebration lunch afterward. But we're reserving that till the following Friday on the 14th. And uh, you don't want to miss that. We're going to have a Western theme because we're really talking about the frontier of faith. And uh, we have uh, the Mariachi group coming in. Uh, Mariachi uh, Daniel, I think their name is. But anyway, they are great. We've had them here before. So it's going to be a, just a great time of celebrating. Uh, and we are having our food uh, uh, catered by Famous Dave's Barbecue. So it's going to be barbecue, Western. And, uh, but you know what? I didn't want to have cake for dessert because this congregation eats a lot of cake. So we really don't need more cake, you know. But we need some pie. So, Stephanie, you want to tell them about that? I sure do. So, um, we're asking, since uh, the, the famous Dave's Barbecue is on the church, uh, if you, any of you could bring a pie, um, then we'd have several different pies, and we can have pie for dessert, kind of to top the whole thing off. So, Good morning, church. Uh, this past week, my wife and I visited her daughter in San Diego, 
And she's doing well. She's been in the hospital seven months now, so continue to pray for Pamela. But on the way home, we heard the devastating news of Thursday. And it kind of put me to dumps, but then I remembered God is still on the throne, so don't fear. And if God is for us, who can be against us? So we have no fear. God is in control, and he's going to make everything righteous again in this country. This evil stuff that's going on has to go away. We're the United States of America. The light of the world is like Jesus. We're the light of the world, and Jesus obviously is the greater light. So let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything you've given us. We thank you for the freedom. We especially thank you for Jesus, who's our hope. And in him we have no fear. Lord, we're going to take a collection today. And I know you love a cheerful giver. And we just pray today that people are cheerful, given to you, the giver of all, to somebody who has everything. But we just want to give a little bit back to you. In Jesus' name, amen. And now we're going to pray as Jesus taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Dan. And uh, we're continuing today in a series where we're looking at the job description of Jesus. If, if you want to know who Jesus is, we need to look at who he says he is. And we find these I am statements in John's gospel. There are seven of them, and we've been uh, steadily looking at them. We've looked at four of them so far. And, you know, when we know Jesus, we understand these statements so well, don't we? When Jesus said, I am the bread of life, the bread of heaven, we, we understand that as believers. We understand that he's what we feed on. And we celebrated that in a way as we took as what we call communion this morning. The light of the world. You know, how different our world view is from that of a non-believer. It is night and day. And I remember as a new believer, it really was like a, a, a literally like a light had come on in our lives. And, and we were decent, you know what I mean? Decent American people, you know. Even though the Bible says all have sinned. <laughs> There's no unrighteous. We didn't realize how unrighteous we were until we walked with the Lord a while. When he says, I'm the door of the sheep. You know, we talked about that. How, how a door keeps certain things out that we don't want in our lives. And it brings, it protects the things that are inside. And that's who Jesus is to us. And of course, when he taught, we talked about the good shepherd. Wow, what a shepherd does for the sheep. He's, he's our everything. So this morning, we're going to look at the, at the fifth um, statement that Jesus made, the I am statement. Remembering each time we see this term I am, we hear the name of God. Because that's who Jesus is. I am the good shepherd. I am the light of the world. So uh, we're going to look at a scripture. Last week we looked at the triumphal entry as Jesus made before he made that uh, statement that he was the good shepherd. But this morning we're looking at very familiar to most of us that have been in the Lord a while and that know the Bible pretty well. This event that happened with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. We've talked about these three people. They were very close friends of Jesus, very intimate. We see three different occasions where when they are together. But there were many other times because of the familiarity that we see in these scriptures that they were together. They're not all recorded. But we probably all know of that one time when Lazarus got sick, deathly ill, and Martha and Mary sent for Jesus, and Jesus was just a few miles away. They, they knew that if Jesus came, he could heal Lazarus, and Jesus deliberately stayed back for the glory of God. How many of you have waited on Jesus to do something, counted on Jesus to come through, and and felt like he just didn't show up beside me. Yeah, you know, if you've walked with the Lord a while, and those are very, very 
tough times, the question marks over our heads. So that's what's going on. He, he doesn't show up and Lazarus dies. And we pick up in John 11, starting in verse 17. On his arrival, so they've called for Jesus. He doesn't show up. The brother dies. And now after he's dead, Jesus comes diddly bopping in. You know what I mean? Like, oh, now you show up. Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Everybody say, four days. Four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. People, Mary is ticked off. I mean, she's hurt. Remember, Mary was at his feet when he came at that one dinner. She was yearning here. And we know that before Jesus died, it was Mary that wept at his feet and anointed his feet with oil, preparing him for his burial. She loved Jesus. And, and like so many of us at times like this, could not understand. She was hurt that Jesus hadn't shown up. Verse 21, Lord Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, oh, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Isn't it easier to have faith for something way off? Right? Then you need a job. And you don't know how you're going to pay your bills. And you need it now. It's t much tougher than thinking about the sweet by and by, you know. Oh yeah, you, when, you know, we know, I know he'll, he'll come or he'll be ri risen at the last day. Jesus said to her, and here's the statement, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? When my brother died on January the 4th, 2009, unexpectedly, that's the verse I had to cling to because the pain was so great and the loss was so deep. I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus said. Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. This is Martha's declaration of faith. She makes it very plain. She believes. You know, we, you and I cannot be Clark Kent Christians. You know what I mean, Superman. But during the day, he was mild-mannered. You know, <laughs> who was he when he was working in the newsroom? <laughs> Clark Kent, yeah. He became Superman. But there are a lot of Clark Kent Christians. You'd never know they were Christians, except when they show up in church or, you know, you spot them, oh, wow, really? <laughs> Martha makes the declaration that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Can't we see that? We think about that at Easter time, don't we, with Jesus' burial. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? You need to chew on that a minute. Man, how many times in my life have I seen the glory of God later? <laughs> you know what I mean? In hindsight, maybe, you know. Or I've, or I've prayed and it was years later that God answered. And then I thought, oh, now I get it. If you believe, you will see the glory of God. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Then he said, when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, 
Lazarus, come out! And many people believe that the reason he had to shout is because Lazarus had no intention of leaving paradise to come back to this. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Wow. What a chunk of scripture we're looking at this morning, right? He backs up this proclamation, I am the resurrection and the life, by bringing Lazarus dead for four long days back to life. And we can only imagine the buzz. <laughs> can you imagine the crowd that was standing there watching this, seeing this, who'd been weeping and mourning for four days and back he comes to life. Out he comes wrapped in grave clothes and then take him off. And he's back. Now, a picture's worth a thousand words. So I want to take a moment. There's this wonderful clip from one of the best accounts, I think, on video uh, of this and of many other things in Jesus' life. Uh, so we're going to watch that for a moment because I, I think it's so necessary that we really see this thing acted out. He said he would be put to death there. And that he would rise again. Master! Master! Martha and Mary, the sisters of your friend in Bethany, have sent me here to find you. Lazarus is very ill, near death. Go. Tell them I'll be there. Even now, whatever you ask of God, God will give it to you. Because I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, He who has come into the world to give us eternal life. Where have you laid him? Come and see. Lord, Lord, I prayed and prayed for you to arrive. You could have kept Lazarus from dying. Take away the stone. But he's been dead four days, Master. His body must already be decaying. Take away the stone.
Now those who stand round me may believe that I am the resurrection and the life. And those who believe in me shall never die. I went down into the countries underneath the earth to the peoples of the past but you lifted my life from the pit Lord my God Lazarus come forth He that believes in me, but he were dead, yet shall he live. Amen. What a powerful piece of film. It's no wonder after three years of Christ's ministry, of him being on the scene, people hearing his preaching, Hearing his, uh, seeing his miracles, and then witnessing this crescendo of his miracles, of his rising, raising Lazarus. And think about how the word would have spread from that. You know, just remarkable. Now, there were other times Jesus raised the dead. We remember um, Jairus' daughter, 12 years old. She was sick and she died, and they were actually kind of holding her wake when he showed up and he said, she's not dead, she's only sleeping. And they mocked him and laughed at him. And then he, he raised her up, but, but she'd not been dead long. And then there was the widow's son when he went through the village of Nain. And uh, this young man, but also he'd not been dead a long time. And Jesus raised him from the dead. And there were no Jewish uh, authorities, no leaders around there to witness that time. But this time there are. And he's been dead for four days. He's been dead all day Monday, and all day Tuesday, and all day Wednesday, and all day Thursday, until Jesus shows up after four days. And you imagine, you know, remember the, the children's song? Never smile when a hearse goes by, for you may be the next to die. He'll wrap you up in a big white sheet and lower you down to about six feet. My favorite part. The worms crawl in, the worms crawl out. The worms play pinochle on your snout. Oh, those happy little children's song that we used to sing on the playground. But it's no wonder when he rides into Jerusalem shortly after this miracle that he is being hailed as Messiah. And all that was child's play before Jesus completed his mission that we celebrated today, that he would die on the cross for our sins and rise to life himself three days later. You know, everything about our faith is dependent on his resurrection. His sinless example of his life, it's not enough. The miracles he did, as great as they were, they are not enough for us. The things he taught incredible things the people were astounded at his teaching because he didn't teach like the authorities his teaching came from God even his death on the cross that we celebrated this morning is not enough without the resurrection because if the resurrection had not happened 
then every promise that Jesus made would fall like a house of cards. Nothing would matter. In Matthew 16, starting in 21, we're not going to actually look at that, but there, elsewhere uh, throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus saying these same things to his followers time and time again, that he would go to Jerusalem, that he would suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed, and that on the third day he would be raised to life again. Remember, Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up again. They didn't get that. He also used the analogy of Jonah being in the belly of the great fish for three days and coming out. In 1 Corinthians, we read this in chapter 15, starting in verse 12. 1 Corinthians, starting in 12. There were rumors going around that the resurrection had not happened, and Paul had to correct this faulty thinking and he said, if it's preached that Christ has been, if it is preached that Christ is raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he, if he, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. All that Jesus prophesied hinges on his resurrection. There are so many things we could talk about today concerning the resurrection of Christ. Our lives revolve around the resurrection. Every time we come into this house, regardless of what is preached, it's always assumed it's based on the resurrection. And it's all based on faith. We believe in the resurrection because of God's word, don't we? It's by faith. 1 Corinthians 15, again, starting in verse 3, says this. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. That's Paul who's speaking. See, we believe the testimonies of those who witnessed the resurrected Christ. And I believe that those that I know that died in Christ are with him now, alive in his presence. You know, faith, the Bible tells us, is the substance. Anything that has substance to us, to it, has has value has has worth it's not just a wisp you know what i mean faith is substance and we have the witness of, 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 in addition to our faith we have the witness of the holy spirit in our hearts second timothy 1 7 says this for the spirit of god the spirit god gave us does not make us timid but gives us power love and self-discipline Hebrews 4.16 says this, Therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. What I love about faith in Christ is there is an assurance. You know, we, we have that old hymn, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Let us come to the throne of grace with confidence. Confidence. Philippians 1.6, For I am confident, again, Paul says, of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Thank God for that scripture. Because there are times <laughs> I feel a little not so confident in what he's doing in me. 
And I know you think the same thing. Not so confident in what God's doing in me. Now, this is where we have visible evidence of Christ's resurrection. It's in resurrected living. It's in changed lives that we see around us. Changed lives through the centuries of people, the church, of people who've come to know Christ. And if we can see it, then we don't require faith in this area. You know, we do require, we do need faith. You know. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But when we look at the evidence, I don't need faith <laughs> in this area. When I see it. You know, it's been said, you can argue doctrine. You can argue belief, but you cannot argue a changed life, right? Jesus begins this new life in us. The moment we receive him, when we put our faith in the resurrected Christ, and we begin resurrected living. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, such a beautiful scripture. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The NIV says he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. I like King James. Old things are passed away Behold, all things are become new. <laughs> you know, we sometimes take that for granted. But we remember it when we were first born again. We just, everything was new. Like our eyes were open, you know. The minute you are born again, I want you to think about that scene we saw with Jesus, his back turned to the people watching, turned to the grave, and he stands there. Come out, come forth. That's what happens to each one of us at salvation. The old man, the dead old stuff, stays behind and we come into resurrected living. I'll tell you. You know, the first 20 years of my life were really good. Like I said, it's good American, good home. You know, again, I didn't know how broken I was. You know, you know. Until I really came to Jesus. And then boy the work began. The surgery began. But we were living in a good, good church going people. And good solid adults all around us. And, and you know the American dream. You know my, my parents instilled in us that w anything was possible. You know and in those days you know go to college. And work hard and you know have a nice home. And have a good life. And bada 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 bada. And then. I hear a woman, and I've told my testimony many times, but I hear Mrs. Helen Engel, my, my friend's mother, just witnessing to somebody in another room and saying, Jesus is coming back. We're living in the end times. And for some reason, somehow the Holy Spirit began, put it, there's like a tiny seed went into me. And it, I just became obsessed for several days until I went back to the house Several days our, our lives in, in the Walker home were just stirred about this whole thing of Jesus coming back. We never talked so much about God in the first 20 years of my life as we did in those three or four days. And here's the weird thing when I think back at this. I'm 20 years old. My life is in, all in front of me. We're, we're in entertainment. I'm having a good time. <laughs> and uh, we were getting ready. This is the summer of 73. We were getting ready to move out here to Las Vegas. So I had bought this little uh, miniature dachshund, Cheryl News dachshund, at a pet shop. And he, I just couldn't resist this little dog. He had a little wrinkled forehead. And so I adopted this little, paid for this little dog, got the dog by my mother. I was, back then, I was so young, I was still listening to what my mother said. Uh, she said, you can't bring a dog out to Las Vegas. So I put an ad in our local paper and gave little Muffet to a good home. And so this couple, older couple that adopted him, said, you can come in and visit him any time. So I thought, we will go in to visit the dog. That was the purpose of going back into Brackenridge, Pennsylvania. We're going to visit the dog, and then we're going to swing by the Engel's house and have Mrs. Engel answer those questions about Jesus coming back, and we'll be on our merry way, you know. So I remember we went in to see the dog and this couple showed us just a few steps down from their kitchen was 
sort of a, a, a basement room that was all carpeted with a little couch, and they said that couch is that couch is the dogs, and they had it. I mean, they they had a really adopted Muffet. I mean, he was going to have a good life. And so that was. So then we head into Engel's house, and I had no idea that I was not going to leave that house the same person I went in. I was going to look the same. I was going to carry some of the same baggage that was in my life. But it was a whole new direction. It was resurrected living. Now, my mother became such a different woman. She just would, you know, I remember, sometimes I'll say to Stephanie, would you believe my mother used to say this? And there'll be some spicy little expression. <laughs> like, you're up, blankety blank, crick, without a paddle. <laughs> or you're, mom, I don't want to eat this for dinner. Well, then you're blankety blank, out of luck. <laughs> and we'll just shake our heads because that's a different woman. My, my dad used to call my mother, after conversion, the mother superior. <laughs> my, mother, my mother used to pray long prayers in restaurants. You know, let's pray, and my mother would, would pray, my, my dad, you know, and uh, they'd go at another couple. And then my dad, being the clown, he was, you know, back in the days when they had ashtrays on the table, and my mother had finished the, tape, uh, the prayer, my dad would pass the ashtray like a collection plate, you know. <laughs> Yeah, the, yeah, right. <laughs> my mother's name was Shirley, and after we left home and we go home to visit, we call her house the Shirley Temple. <laughs> Bring, show them that memory. Uh, oh, there we are. Yeah, yeah. So we had a few laughs, but she was she was a different woman. Colossians three uh, two twelve says this: having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Now, the New Living Translation says, that, says it this way, for you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Jesus said in John 14, 19, because I live, you also will live. Jesus said to Lazarus, take, said to the people around him, take off the grave clothes and let him go. That's conversion. That's the beginning of resurrected uh, living in our life. We took the grave clothes off in 1973 and we, and we went, you know. Here we go. And it's been quite a journey. The resurrected life does not begin as we once thought when we were religious, when your heart stops, it begins when your heart starts. A new heart in Christ. David Walker, you know, we all know David. Uh, he comes here from time to time and preaches. And he said, if you're saved just to go to heaven, why doesn't God take us to heaven the minute we get saved? Because he's got work for resurrected people to do. I will never forget this costume lady that we had that did our costumes for many years and there were these rumors around that she was born a man you know people didn't talk about transgender back then and I remember looking at Hetty Jo Starr <laughs> I should have known from the name something was amiss and she was a miss not a mister but uh but she was an <laughs> but you know what I decided at that time I thought I'd hear these rumors and I'm thinking well she looks like a middle-aged woman. That is the way we're going to treat her. And so we would just go to our shop. And one thing I remember is we never witnessed to her. We'd go in, have a fitting. You know, we'd just be ourselves. And eventually the IRS, uh, they started having trouble, Hetty, uh, having trouble with the IRS. And many people have come to the Lord because of the IRS. We can thank God for the IRS. And you know when Hetty died, what day she died on? April 15th. But this I remember, and it, and it really shows me the power of Christ's resurrection in our lives. She, my sister invited her to the church. We were going to a four-square church. 
And Hetty went into that church and got saved. Just as she was. Found out, yeah, she had been born a man. But see, God saves us. Sometimes people that have this sort of situation, they go back to their original gender. Sometimes mutilated, but back to... And some don't. The important thing is that they go to heaven, right? Amen. But this is what she said. She said, every time the walkers came into my shop, they brought God with them. Now, I don't know how that was possible because I didn't say anything. But you know, there's something that goes on when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives that people see and that they smell and that they feel and that they, they, there's something different. Man, we went home uh, on vacation. You know, it's just amazing when you see Christ in other people's lives, you know, because I think we're so close to ourselves, we, we kind of miss it, you know. But I went to school with a girl named Marilyn Houston. We, we were actually born on the same day, January 9th, 1953. And, you know, we weren't real close in high school, but I rode the school bus with her for years. And, and then after uh, we left home, from time to time when we would go home, we would go to this Assembly of God church. And I'd see Marilyn... And her husband, who was a football player, Chris Siracco, and, and I was so thrilled that they that I see them in church raising their hands. Oh, thank God, they're resurrected people too, you know. Now, they had five, they were solid Christian people. They had five children. As the years went on, two of their adult children died. Their daughter died like a 33 uh, breast cancer. The son got something when he was about 34, 35. Uh, a year or two after this, some mysterious thing, and he died. They lost two other children, but their faith remained. And then two years ago, uh, Chris, her husband, died. And the last time we were home, Stephanie and I went out to dinner with Marilyn. This woman with all this loss, you know what I mean? And we picked her up for dinner, and we drove about a half an hour or so away to where we were having dinner, and we had dinner, and then we drove... The whole time, we, all she talked about, all we talked about was life in the Lord. How life was so good. Then how does somebody live through, you know, the worst thing you can live through is the death of a child. Everybody says it. And yet this woman is still living the resurrected life, the hope, the joy. And I see resurrected life, you know, we see it every time we have somebody, you know, the once a year, we have the people from the hoving home, the women. Women coming off drugs and alcohol. Men from Teen Challenge. They get up and they talk about the death life they had. And then we see this new life in them. And I was just telling Scott this morning. The most powerful people I see in the Lord are those who've had life-controlling issues. Because what they, when they come out of those grave clothes... They come out of those grave clothes. And when they begin resurrected living, you see it. Really evident. I think about Ed. I will never forget how Ed came in here. Just kind of put up with the church for a couple of years, you know. Had been burned through a number of circumstances with people and churches. And then one night, the Holy Spirit had him watch somebody on TV, and it was like that. So it was resurrected living. You know, God is so gracious. God knows exactly how to get us out of the grave and into resurrected living. Amen. And the pops, you know, they popped in. <laughs> you know. And we watched uh, Shirley, her, Mrs., you know, Jim's mother, and, and Jim... Just watch them grow in their faith. They come out of Catholicism. And I'm sorry, but sometimes religion is, is a death trap. It's a grave, you know. And that's not always true, even of Catholics or some of these mainline Protestant denominations. Not everybody in the church is dead, but many are, you know. And have to come out of those grave clothes. Zena's not here today. And, and Ernie. But man, when they first started coming, I remember Ernie saying, Ernie also... Uh, attended the Catholic Church up in Canada. 
And every, he would come up to me week after week and say, I can't believe how I, you know, what you're saying makes sense. I, I believe it. I, I never understood what the priests were saying. Yeah. Well, that's because one resurrected person is speaking, you know. It's a whole different thing. Zena the same way. Zena had been kind of uh, stillborn, you know. She, she came to the Lord as a child but had no discipleship. And then she started coming here. And I just watched what, how the Lord has worked in her life. 1 Peter 1.3 says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, as we get ready to close, you and I too often get used to resurrected life. We forget. You know, we should go back to the old days. We should go back to our new... You know, when, when the Lord was speaking to the churches in Revelation, and he said, remember the height from which you've fallen. Return to your first love. We need to remember what life was like when we first came out of the grave. Remember how exciting the Bible was. Remember what it was like to really, really pray. You know, not just now I lay me down to sleep or God is great, God is good, let us thank Him for our food. But really pray from our hearts, you know. And how different life was. Like, wow, I used to swear all the time. And now I'm not swearing anymore, you know. You forget. We become used to it. I'll tell you, there is nothing like living in Jesus. And there is nothing better than the hope we have in the resurrection. And when we walk with him and we look back over our lives, we begin to see how far we've come. You know, so many times we look at how far we have to go. Man, I'm not this. I should be this. But we need to think about how far we've come in this journey. And how much resurrection is evidence in our lives. A few more scriptures. Colossians 3, starting in verse 1. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears then you also will appear with him in glory. We have to choose people. You know, there's so much in our lives that are choice. You may not feel like forgiving somebody, but you can choose to forgive somebody. You may not feel like giving, but you can give. You may not feel like doing a whole lot of things. But when Christ calls us into this new life. <laughs> you know it is such a miracle when I look back on my life. That Stephanie and I have been married 19 years. You know I've told you my testimony. I was in a completely different zone. It was not by my own fault. It was not something I desired. But I was stuck. And I was stuck in it as a Christian because there was no help for me in the church in those years when I was young. And I got into a, a relationship that just became very complex and uh, not pretty. The, the, the one good thing I got out of it is I know that life doesn't work. It does not work. What's celebrated today really should be a place of shame in this culture. I just saw a big thing in the paper about this pride month and this pride. Pride? People are pride proud of what they used to hide it's unbelievable how life has changed Galatians 2 20 I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me the life I live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me I think we've come to the end I just want to encourage you today, people. I want you to think about that raising of Lazarus. 
And I want you to think about this statement that Jesus made. I am the resurrection and the life. We're not talking about way, you know, years down the road when our bodies will be resurrected. We're talking about our lives right now. We live as resurrected people. So the word as we close today is this. Take off the grave clothes, whatever they may be, and go forth. Let's pray. Lord, these statements that Jesus made are chock full. Just chock full of life and of hope and of glory. Lord, we love you. Jesus, we, we thank you for being the bread of our lives. For being the light of our lives, Lord. You have brought light into a dark life, into a dark world. You are the door of the sheep, Lord, that we gladly enter. Keep us protected, Lord, from all the things that shouldn't be in our lives. And Lord, we see you time and time again as such a sweet and good shepherd. And we are so thankful, Lord, that you are the resurrection and the life. As Dan mentioned earlier, Lord, we live in such a challenging, dark time. But we are the people of God, the resurrected people who serve a resurrected Lord. We have hope and we are the hope of this world. So, Father, let this ring in our hearts this week. Anytime we are tempted through this week to return to the grave close, Lord, reinvigorate us. Fill us anew with your spirit. Help us to walk as your resurrected people. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen.